Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Tech Connect Podcast. I'm John Martin. And I'm Dean Reverman. So we're on something a little bit different today. We're kind of queuing up an episode. Yes. Uh, so we were at Vartech uh, a couple, few weeks back, recorded a couple live episodes there yes. in front of a studio dun, audience. Dun, dun, live. Very exciting. You saw one of them last are, week already. Are we live now? We're live. What? <laughs> Suddenly, I got the jitters. Uh, okay, so so we recorded these two these two podcasts in front of an audience. It was a lot of fun. We had a great time. You saw the one last week already with Jody Costa. It was a great fun episode. Well, we actually recorded another one before that first. We did with the incomparable James Cordy. Uh, unfortunately, because you know we were trying this whole on the road live thing out for the first time, we had a little bit of an audio bug at the beginning, so we didn't get some of the very initial yep. audio recordings. The gerbils weren't moving right. just yet. All yeah. you basically missed was our typical intro, me and Dean bantering about something. Something. introducing James Cordy, which if you don't know James Cordy by now, you've you obviously not, not been watching now? the podcast. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's Blue Star's digital marketing manager and mentioning that our topic was about optimizing LinkedIn and social media for your business. Yep. And this was kind of a little bit of a passion project for me and Cordy. We had mm -hmm. actually discussed doing this at Vartech as a session, I think, mm -hmm. years ago, yep. and then decided, you know, hey, let's turn it into a podcast. Right. And we didn't have Vartech last year, so we finally did it this year. And it's because both of us have always looked at people's profiles, whether it was for companies or for people, their web pages, their presence sometimes. And, and you cringe. We basically. do. We cringe at it and you go, ah, like yeah. you should be doing better at this yes. if this is the first place that people come to see who you are. So yeah. that was kind of the impetus for this podcast. Mm -hmm. The only thing you missed is the very first question that I asked, which was, is LinkedIn really that important? Uh, yeah. And should our people, our VARs, our channel be living there? Yep, yep. And really the most important, because we all basically said yes. Yes. But the most important answer <laughs> that came out of that was Cordy himself said, if your customer is there, you should be there. Bingo. That's the number one thing that came out of that. That's is right. If you if your customers live in that space, if, if the executives in supply chain, which we know is one that's there, mm -hmm. your higher ups in retail, if they're on LinkedIn, you should be on LinkedIn. Well, by the way, well. they are there. They, they are, are there. So they you are. should be there. Exactly. So mm -hmm. that's really all you missed. We were going to get you to the rest of the show. It's a fun episode, uh, especially stick around at the end. There are some surprises that pop up yes. in, the, in the What's Tech Connected yes. segment this week. So Whoa. with that said, it's time to plug in and get connected. Welcome to the Tech Connect podcast. It's time to get connected. Get connected. Get connected. Let's talk about the fact that obviously, yes, you have two types of pages on LinkedIn. There's your, your personal company, your personal page for yourself. Mm -hmm. you know, this is my John Martin page. I'm the yada, yada, yada. Here's all the stuff that I do. Here's my posts. But then there's also a company page for your own company too. Do we feel like one of them is more important than the other at all? And, may, and the other attached question to that is, assuming you have a company page that you're using, who should be running that? Who should be taking care of that? Sure. I'll jump in on this one. So... I think initially, a lot of this is my gut and my uh, observation of what I see. And in general, what I see is that personal profiles get more engagement and seem to get more reach. But as I've researched a little bit, what I found out was the same opportunity is given to your company page and your personal profile with uh, regard to the algorithm, meaning uh, the way the LinkedIn algorithm works. Uh, according to people who have, who have broken it down, is when you make a post, a few things get looked at kind of programmatically. Is this a high quality post? Meaning is the grammar correct? Are you using one or zero links? Because one of the things, and this, this was kind of a light bulb moment for me, LinkedIn doesn't want you to leave the platform, right? They don't get advertising dollars and eyeballs on their ads when you're clicking to go to someone else's website. So they give some preference to I'm sure you guys have seen the trend if you do spend time on LinkedIn of like that long form post, right? That's like really choppy and is, is designed to keep you there and, and, and read the content in the feed. Um, so I guess to answer the question, I have seen people have more success with personal profiles than company profiles, but company profiles do have that same opportunity. So I'll finish the thought about kind of the process when a post is made. The initial evaluation of, is, is the grammar correct? Are there a low number of links? They're not spamming hashtags, things like that. If it passes that filter, there's what they call the golden hour, where a post is showing up in the feeds of your followers, if it's a company, or your connections, if, if you're a personal profile. And then it goes 
into an, you know, kind of an engagement analysis. Are people liking, are people commenting? And if that's true, and it's kind of gaining momentum, John, you made this comment kind of before we started rolling, um, some posts will kind of stay in orbit for over a week. You'll see something that's a five-day-old post that's just continuing to serve because it's getting that engagement. So um, again, answer is both. What, what I feel like uh, is true for a lot of companies that are doing LinkedIn well in particular is that the personal profile is a breadcrumb to the company profile. Yep. Meaning if John Martin or Dean Reverman or James Cordy are making thoughtful, uh, insightful posts, Eventually, people you know, within our networks or those that are on the periphery that are connected to our connections are gonna go, who the heck are these guys or are these ladies? And they're gonna end up clicking on our profile and clicking on our company profile. And I think that's the way we should be thinking about kind of equipping our teams, right? So if everything's coming from the company profile that's got you know, a logo instead of a face, mm -hmm. it's not probably gonna see the same engagement as if real humans are making those same comments. So that's the way I think about the whole company versus personal. It makes sense to invest in both. But if you, know, if you do have the team that's willing, so to speak, to use their, their personal platform uh, for the benefit of the company, which also benefits them, I mean, let's be honest, if they're you know, building a, a personal awareness or, or brand, it's gonna benefit the company as well. So. Let's dive, let's get in a little bit more granular because I agree with you, you know, and I think that one of the challenges that we as Blue Star realize, and I know many of you are facing as well, it's like, okay, so I see the importance of a personal page, right, and that's necessary, and the importance of a company page, but how do we get the entire company to understand that? You know, we come out of marketing, so we live it every day, right, and we understand that, and sales, anybody in sales understands the value of LinkedIn, but I think where the challenge is, and Blue Star is not immune to this at all, and, and I think it's going to be, we're having our strategy meetings after this, and we're going to try to dive into a, a better strategy, but it's also getting other team members within your, within your company engaged on the platform and understand the value of it. You know, yep. it is not the normal thing for an engineer or operations or people in accounting to think of themselves as a front line, on the front line of your company's persona. I'll just put it that way, right? Yeah. Because when you when you dive into the platform, anybody within the company now is is a window into the company, and so directing people and coming up with a strategy around that, I think, is is difficult. And and where, really where companies are starting to hone their whole strategy, or at least the smart ones, hopefully, are starting to hone that strategy. Would you agree? Yeah, I, w I would agree. And I'll, I'm sure you guys have seen this. Uh, I think people are thinking about it. I don't know that they're always getting it right. I'd say more often right. right now, what you see is a company is aligned to everyone sharing the same message. Literally, the company makes a post and it gets reshared by 8, 10, 12, 15 people. And there's something to that, right? If I reshare it, then you know my network sees it, but I, I don't believe that the algorithm necessarily looks upon that nearly as favorably as if Blue Starter were to make a post about Vartech. And then I said, oh, you know what? I'm going to go find or source from the marketing team my own image and write my own spin on it. Use the hashtag or another. So in my mind, um, resharing a company or even a colleague's post, it's not a bad thing. It certainly isn't. But the two better options would be echoing it with your own kind of unique spin or commenting on their post. Because of what we said a minute ago, the algorithm gives you that moment where if you are starting to get some momentum in the forms of comments, which... And a lot of this isn't science, it's kind of observation and gut feeling. I believe a comment is probably a bit higher than a like would be. It takes a little bit more effort. It shows that there's really a conversation happening. So that would be my, you know, so I guess to sum it up, what I've seen is that companies who are on the same page, a lot of them are on the same page to say, hey, when we hit publish, you guys all get in there and the army's gonna reshare. Not a bad thing, but I think a better thing is, hey, we're gonna publish. Here are some bullet points, maybe a few different images, maybe you could go grab your own. The variety, I think, is better than just kind of the robotic and reshare. And, and I think that's part of the tweak that the honing, if you will, of company strategies that they're starting to, to deploy and certainly will be in that in that boat as well. Yeah. No and I think, you know, to kind of answer the other question I had posited there, which is who should be running your company page, is you want someone that understands marketing. You want someone that is good and prolific at posting, someone that gets kind of how social media works, someone that understands, you know, the hashtag environment, someone understands what makes posts go viral. Uh, you know, you, you need somebody that can kind of do that. And you may not, because you may not have somebody on your team that is the designated marketing person or social media person, but I guarantee you, you probably have someone on your team that 
gets social media and gets this kind of marketing. And John, I could see it being a team of two. You know, the notes right. I made about this question were someone that's well connected throughout the organization. You know, if you've got a bigger company like Blue Star, Dean, you made the point that maybe people in, you know, customer support, operations at different areas don't realize how valuable some of what they can share would be to our customers. And they're probably not going to be your social manager. So maybe you've got the person who understands the platforms, but then you have the person who's more of your content curator, who is connected to the different departments, who you can trust if they were actively, you know, doing the posting and stuff. It's got to be someone with, you know, high level of trust throughout the organization. Um, and I think maybe most importantly, someone who understands that people don't come to LinkedIn just to hear what your company wants to say about themselves. Right. You know, right. every, every second message can't be, we got an event, here's our new product, you know, whatever. You've got to be sharing information that, that enriches people. People come to LinkedIn to, you know, be up to date with their network and they come to learn. So give them something beyond just, you know, the corporate message. It legitimately is a very content driven platform. Yeah. Yeah. Which you, I don't think you can say that about a lot of other, I mean, uh, there's other social media that's built on whatever its particular brand of content is. But I think LinkedIn is one in particular that, that definitely that algorithm really seems to strongly push and drive content. Whether it is simply an interesting blog post, you know, whether it is you actually sharing an article or sharing an ebook or something like that. It's part of why we use LinkedIn for some of our marketing campaigns for our, you know, for our, our VAR partners and, and vendors. John, I read this morning that only 3% of uh, LinkedIn users post once a month. Wow. And I say that just to say that it is hugely content driven, but it's super top heavy. There's a lot of people doing a lot of that right, lifting. Right. And the way that I thought about that was there's still a huge opportunity, especially in some of the niches, right? The, we're not the Googles and the Apples of the world necessarily, you know, with millions of followers, but there is still a huge opportunity on LinkedIn on the organic side, meaning non-paid, that if you are creating valuable content, uh, things that people would be interested in reading, there is an ability to, to make noise pretty quickly. Again, yeah. once a month. It, it sounds easier than it actually is, yeah. but you know, if you could get to a couple times a month and get some momentum going. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, then let's get, kind of get into the heart of this conversation, which is the idea of how to optimize your presence on LinkedIn. You know, what should I be doing? What should my profile look like? What should I be posting? What should I be commenting on? Uh, you know, I've got a few things we wrote down here, but I kind of want all of us to maybe just kind of take a couple of these points and, and dive into where we think you can really make a difference here. So obviously there's your profile itself. If you're looking at your personal part, your, your profile pic, your job experience, the stats about you or yourself and your business life or whatever, stuff like what you post, what you share. We've kind of talked a little bit about that. Uh, the personal part of things. Dean, you mentioned that, you know, it's a business driven platform, but people do like to post personal stuff, uh, engaging with audience, with commenters, connecting with other people. So pick one or two of those James, I'll let you start here and kind of riff on where you think someone can make a, a difference and an impact on their profile. I'll try to be concise here since I know we don't have a ton right. of time. <laughs> these, these are the details I love to get into. This is the stuff that I think is really important. So I'll just, I'll pick a couple. Um, so obviously we all have our professional experience on our profile where we've worked. There's something separate though, and you all see it, and this is going to be one of those obvious but really important things, your headline on LinkedIn is not your job title. It could be, but it is separate from your job title. What you put in there is the, it, the way, and again, I'm, an, I'm in a marketing guy, so I'm going to get really in the details here, but think about when you're looking at your email application on your smartphone or on your laptop or whatever. You've got the sender, right? The person's name or the company's name. And then underneath that, whether it's Gmail or Outlook or, or whatever, there's a bit of what's called preview text. It's usually just the first HTML copy text that shows up in the email. Your LinkedIn headline operates in that same way. Anytime that your little picture and your name shows up in a feed, whether you're liking or you're posting, right underneath it is your headline. So some people will have, you know, product at Google, or some people will have, you know, marketing leader, designer, enthusiast, which is my headline. I borrowed the enthusiast from Anthony Bourdain. That was his Twitter profile. I always thought it was cool. Um, so the headline is very important because, again, it's that little snapshot people see whenever you're interacting or posting or what have you. Um, so, so pay some attention to that if you haven't already. Uh, one example, I have a friend I worked with early, early on in my career. He's a really smart, tactical kind of guy, too. He's now a franchise development, like BDM, business development guy. His headline is, curious why I viewed your profile? Call mm -hmm. me. And he has his phone number in it. 
again, he, you know, he's a sales like business that. development guy, but that's his strategy. Is he goes and I'm sure you guys have seen this too. He views people's profiles and then they go, well, who the heck's this Jonathan Anderson guy? They click on his, they see his headline and go, I'm not going to call this guy. But for those that are interested, you know, it's, it's a smart little tactic. Uh, and one other thing I'll mention, I'm sure because I've been in rooms like this before talking about going out and creating all this content and I assume that approximately 50% of you are like, I'm not gonna do all this stuff. Maybe it's interesting, maybe it's not, but I'm not gonna do all of this. But for maybe the other 50% that are considering going out and you know, trying to get active on LinkedIn, look into the creator profile. It's a simple toggle, you turn on the creator profile and a few different things happen, probably more than I'll be able to kind of lay out for you right now. But what, would have, what is today a connect button for someone to connect with you, can become a follow button primarily. It's, the connect is still there, but the, the primary kind of call to action on your profile is to follow. That is so important. I use this a lot with people I want to follow because right. I don't know them. I know, so to speak, uh, maybe I wouldn't mind being connected, but we're not, a, you know, we're not a real connection, which is right. kind of the way it was designed, but I want their content to show up. I hit follow and I start seeing their content in my feed. Some other tools get added. You can add the hashtags you talk about frequently. You get some additional analytics on the content you share. Um, when LinkedIn rolls out new analytics tools, you get you know, primary access to those things and it costs nothing. It's j literally just a toggle and it slightly changes kind of the nature of your profile. The last thing I'll say, and I don't know if this is unique to creator profiles or if it's available to anyone, but if or when you start creating content, there's a featured section that shows up. If you can kind of visualize a profile, you've got your image and your name. Uh, I forget what's underneath that. And then there's a block where you can basically pin content you've shared. So uh, there was a short period of time where I would create these multi-page PDFs. When you embed a PDF doc in LinkedIn, it kind of takes on the behavior of a slideshow. And it would be five tips for email marketing or you know the six best free marketing tools. And I would pin those things to my profile. So if I make a new connection and they're looking at my profile, those things are kind of right there at the top. So some, some cool little tools. John, there was one other thing I wanted to touch on, but I'll let someone else weigh in on this and I'll try to remember what it was. Okay. <laughs> Dean, what about you? What's, what do you think about endorsements? I mean, I, in skills, you know, the skills and endorsements section. I know, those sections I don't feel like I use that much. I know, right? It got a long, uh, it got a run for a while, yeah. you know, and, and everybody was endorsing other yeah. people and your best friend and stuff right. like that. But, but I still think it's meaningful in the sense of utilizing it and it and, and brings context to your ecosystem. And, then, and that's the way I kind of view it is like, okay, here's who I am. And of course, you, you're going to put some things about who you are and where you've been and your education. But because I think people still want to try to make a connection, right? If, right. They're, if they're following you, okay, who's this person? What is their context? Um, I think that endorsements can be, if utilized correctly, uh, and know the value behind them, still have meaning. Yeah. But maybe not quite I think as, what's weird about them is that you kind of have to ask other people to endorse you. Right. And no one feels comfortable like, hey, will you say something nice about me on here? Right. But but you can go out and do that for other people on your own. Like yeah. You don't have to wait for someone to ask you. You would go actively. How cool would that right. be? That's, I think that's, that's where yeah, I would go. How right. awesome would that be? Yeah, if you're just sitting there one day and it suddenly pops up on your profile, it's so-and-so endorsed you for something. You didn't ask for it. You didn't, you know solicit it or anything. Yeah. And they just simply got on and said, oh, so-and-so is fantastic at marketing. They're amazing at sales. I love talking to this person. They know everything there is to know about this. It makes you feel good. You feel yeah. good about that. And then, yeah, it's, it lives on your profile. That's something that when someone drops by, they see, hey, other people that I respect or know in this industry really seem to have a, a strong, favorable feeling towards this person. Mm -hmm. I want to get to know them as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So anyway, okay. I just wanted to throw that on the table because I think that in, in the skills, it's just one of those areas that it just brings a, a little bit more robust picture about who right, you are right. and what you can do right. and where you've been yeah. type of a thing. Yeah, I agree. So. I'll throw a couple little simplistic stuff in here. So one, an interesting question people pop up sometimes is, what do I use for a profile pic? Do I have to have the the business picture, you know, where I'm wearing a, a suit or, a, you know, my best clothes or whatever and have like a, a great shot that was taken by a professional photographer? Not necessarily, but at the same time, again, this is meant to be a business profile. So I do see some sometimes that look like very casual shots, you know, that were just part of someone's iPhone, you know, roll or whatever or or some kind of weird glamour shot type A selfie thing. at the amusement park yeah, that exactly. they tried to cut themselves Someone's on. dogs in the background, your kids or something, whatever. And I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But again, you got to realize that sometimes when someone comes looking for information about you or about your company, that might be literally the first thing they see. You know, they're, they search your name, that pops up. And for one, if that photo doesn't clearly look like you, 
And that's where I will put my other little <laughs> foot down here, which is update your damn photos. I know you looked fantastic 20 years ago. We all looked fantastic 20 years ago, but that's not what you look like today. I hate to tell you. Some of, well, maybe, I don't know, maybe Cordy. He's, he never seems to age. He never age. ages. Some people don't seem to age, but <laughs> for the most part, most of us don't look like what we looked like when we got started in business. So it's okay to put that newer picture up there. I know you love to live in the glory days, but it always amazes me when I will see someone's profile picture because I always connect with someone who's one of our guests on the podcast ahead of time. And then they'll pop up on the video feed when we're doing the episode, and I go, who is this person? Oh, that's, that's that person, but their, their picture was ridiculously old. I'll just add a one-liner in, in terms of your profile pic. Dress for the job you want, right? And, <laughs> and I mean that and the opposite as well. Right, I mean, right. I sometimes look at you know, creative directors from previous jobs and stuff like that, and they do have that. They're showing their personality, as right. they should. Right, right. Because like you said, it's a first impression. But you know, I imagine we probably got a lot of... Uh, owners, if not, you know, higher level executives in the room, and they're probably not trying to come across as, right. uh, you know, hipster Well, I admit, I, like, I updated my pick in the last year, and I had, like, a suit and tie pick for a long time, but it looked at it and it occurred to me, I don't wear a suit and tie ever. Nope. <laughs> so I just, you know, I did a little selfie sitting at my desk at home and, you know, put it in black and white and made it look, make me... Make me look a little contemplative as the writer that I am. Yes, so, right. Yeah. You know, it's still at least it's me. It, it Nailed it. Me. So yeah, yeah. Uh, the other one, uh, a couple other things. I had job experience. You don't have to put your job experience all the way back to what you did in middle school at McDonald's. Okay, seriously, no one cares about that stuff. Honestly, your last. Think about it like your resume. You, typically, on our resumes, we're usually taught, "Hey, just put your last two to three jobs on there, or maybe the last." decade or you know 15 years worth yeah. of, of professional experience 10 or 12 years of history yeah that's all people yeah. really care about anyway so you don't have to put all that on your your linkedin profile either you can you know just just cut down to what you've been doing most recently especially if those old jobs have nothing to do with what you do now and nothing to do with who you are now and who you want to be seen as they don't need to be there that's a good point uh, but i'll add right real quickly on that and I, I come from a design background so maybe this isn't super applicable but if there were projects campaigns that you were a part of at particular jobs, you can add links to them that will show up right below that job post. And they're like little mm -hmm. rounded squares where you can link out to cool mm -hmm. stuff. So again, if, if there's things that exist on the web you could link to. I like that. that you mentioned creator mode. I was going to talk about that. I think creator mode is a nice new feature that's on there, especially if you are someone that likes to post a lot. It's a great way to let people know. I, what I found was cool about it is you can actually add like three or four hashtags to your profile of this is the stuff that I like to talk about on a regular basis. So like mine, for instance, will have like podcasting, content development, marketing, work from home, stuff that I tend to talk about a lot. So if someone visits my profile and they're thinking about following me, you know, maybe they don't want to connect with me, but they want to follow me to see my posts. They know, hey, this is what I will expect to see from this guy in his feed on a regular basis. Uh, and then the, the only last thing I'll put it there is, and Dean, you hinted at this a little bit earlier, this idea of how personal you should get on LinkedIn mm -hmm. because people like to post a lot of personal stuff. And I, I'm not saying you should never do that because sometimes I see very inspirational stories that can be related to work and, you know, and, and how people overcome. You know, we just listened to Jason Redman talk all about you know, his personal life and how that can connect to what you do in the business world. But be careful about that, too, at the same time, because there's a lot of people out there and there's a lot of potential customers out there that may not feel the same way about things that you do. And I'm always amazed when I see someone get in someone's comments on some post that will light up, you know, their whatever they were posting about, have something negative to say, and I see their picture, their name, and the company they work for, you know, and they're, they're oftentimes like some high executive or something, and they are basically connecting whatever bad take they just decided to throw in there, or, you know, or at least whatever hot take they threw in there <laughs> with themselves and their company. And I'm always amazed by that and seeing, like, you realize that's out there for everybody to see. And if someone goes and looks at your profile, they can look at all anything that you have posted on, anything you have commented on, and see a laundry list of all the stuff and all the times you decided to make some pretty edgy comments that maybe you shouldn't have made. It's not like Facebook. There's, it's not like the rest of the internet where there's that level of anonymity out there and you can go post whatever you want and nobody knows who you know uh, Google Star 101 is. It's tied to you <laughs> and your company. So just be aware of that. Anytime you post or do anything or comment on LinkedIn, you are, in a way, speaking for your company, whether you like it or not. Yeah, you can get a pretty pretty quick feel for just someone's general attitude and their activity feed on LinkedIn. Exactly. Yeah. I don't run into a lot of super negative people, but it, like you said, yeah. it's, it's out well, there. It's, yeah, it's usually people that I would never be associated with anyway for various random other industries, but I'm always amazed when 
just some random post, and I will see someone's comments on there, and people starting, like, you know, comment wars. Yeah. Like, this is not Facebook. This is not where you do this. Yeah. Sorry. Just going to mention that there's kind of a movement that uh, – uh, that this isn't Facebook, right? That's a real common thing people are saying to each other, usually in the political realm when, when it kind of creeps there. But I'm going to take, you guys have both mentioned a little bit about the personal side of things. And I'm going to have just a little bit of a different take on it, which is that I am, um, you know, I'll say it's probably more of a, what is it, Gen Z? Are those the, are those the ones below millennials? It's Gen yeah. Z. Yes, yeah. yes. They've got this thing about bringing your whole self to work, right? Being who you are, sharing a bit about who you are. Because again, people like to do business with people. And I guess as a marketer, I'm going to connect this a little bit to marketing strategy, which is um, your product isn't for everyone. Literally, by its design, it is not meant for everyone. It's not going to work for tiny businesses or huge businesses. You've got a sweet spot somewhere, right? And I think the same is true about business. Do you want to leave great deals on the table? No, not necessarily. But do you necessarily want to do business with people that you wouldn't want to sit and you know have a meal with? Maybe not. So for certain... Don't be outrageous and edgy right, just right. for that sake. You know, don't do all of that. But I do like it when some of my connections, not necessarily overshare about personal stuff, but like Jim Roddy in the front here, I know a bit about Jim's story and I, I like that. We know each other, right? And so I, I'm, I'm a little bit more open to knowing a bit more right. about my When it's part of the bra your brand that you're kind of creating for yourself, there's nothing wrong with that. Agreed. Let's get into this one then, written versus video, because I think Cordy does a better job than anybody here yeah. about yeah. utilizing video as a tactic on LinkedIn, right? I mean, you've been advocating it for a long time. I need to do a better job, I think, of, of utilizing video because I think it's, it speaks a language that is unique. Uh, and if you do it right, it, it can hold more water, uh, maybe than the written word uh, out there. What do you think? Yeah, so here's what I'll say. I am 39 years old. I am the oldest you can possibly be while still being considered a millennial. But <laughs> truly, I'm not really comfortable being out there on video, even though we're literally being recorded as I'm speaking. <laughs> It took me some time, and it's, this is a bit different, right? I mean, you know, yeah. we're together, whatever. But it's just me. I'm turning on a camera, my webcam, and I'm going to say something and put it on LinkedIn. I don't feel real comfortable about that. But after I did it the first time, the next time I felt 15 more, per, you know, percent more comfortable doing it again. And now it's, you know, I'm not doing it super frequently. But um, well, I'll say this about video. I think when you, you when you post a video, people like to see people. As strange as that, when people post a new profile photo, it's, oh, you know, what do they look like now? It's been three years or whatever. So when someone can see you, I think it helps your post to stand out. But one of the things I've learned from my own posts and one of the things I've read about other people who have analyzed this is that people, uh, I, I read a stat today, people on average, even the active, you know, monthly, weekly users only spend around 20 minutes on average a month on LinkedIn. People are, are, are quick scrolling. Video, even though it's effort, can get attention and eyeballs on your post, but I would highly recommend transcribing most, if not your entire video, your whole key point, because most people are likely, you know, it'll have the stopping power, so to speak, when you're scrolling the feed. Oh, what's this? Look, Cordy posted another video. Let's, you know, but they're see still his scrolling bedroom on background, memes. and they're going to probably read the text more so than actually tap the video. Right. You know, they're in right. line at Starbucks or whatever. They don't want to, you know, blast everybody in line. So. I think video is a great tool, but don't just think, don't assume people are going to actually watch the video. Make sure you are reiterating the point in text. I think that would be my, my big recommendation there. Yeah, hard agree there. Well, let's wrap up. I, you know, I, I put something here about advertising. I don't want us to dive too far in that because that's almost an entirely different conversation. But I will say, and James and I can both attest to this, that LinkedIn advertising is an amazing place to advertise B2B. Uh, they have probably the most comprehensive way of filtering and targeting, and targeting yep. you know, other businesses that you can find. So if it's not something you invest in, and it's really not terribly expensive either. I mean, you can put a couple grand into, into a campaign that, you know, if you're trying to reach a certain type of customer and you can, you can get as narrow as you want or as broad as you want and, and reach a pretty significant number of people. We do it a lot for our content marketing campaigns where we go out and, and, and target end users on behalf of our VAR and software partners. And, you know, a, a lot of success. Of it. And granted, like most other social media these days and like most other advertising these days, it's it's rarely about generating a hard lead that someone's going to be able to call up and, and, and just get a sale immediately. Mm -hmm. But it's very much about you know brand awareness. It's very much about getting eyes on something. It's about getting information about someone who may be interested in your product that you can then reach out to further. And, and I feel like people are very, they're very open to you know, to connecting and to giving information and, and requesting to look at content on LinkedIn more so than probably anywhere else. Would you agree? 
Yeah, I would agree. I mean, it is, it's the number one targeting tool, like you said, for B2B. Uh, it, it can be certainly affordable. It can also get a little bit pricey. It can, yes. So I think <clears throat> the quick comment I'll make is there is nothing better than LinkedIn when it comes to B2B paid advertising from a targeting standpoint. Facebook is considerably cheaper, but it has a considerable drawback when it comes to targeting businesses. You just kind of have to get lucky that the job title pops up. So if you're trying to reach you know, chief nursing officers, fire chiefs, I know these are random targets, but these are some of the campaigns that we've run. Um, <clears throat> Uh, pharmacy owners, these are things you can achieve on Facebook. If you're trying to reach a director of operations in warehousing, two layers, that gets really tricky on Facebook, and it is a breeze on LinkedIn. Yeah. So yeah, LinkedIn's uh, a really great ad tool. Totally agreed. Yeah. Any other thoughts before we wrap up the main conversation here about other social media like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram? Do they have a place in our channel? Do they have a place in, in business marketing? How should they be used? I mean, I we don't really use them as much as we potentially could. You just mentioned, obviously, Facebook is it's hard targeting, but there are some way, people and ways that you can target there you know, just as effectively and for a, at a lower cost. Well, how do you feel about this other platform? I've got a one-liner, <clears throat> which is just wherever your people are is where you belong. I said I like in the it. upfront, there are audiences that under-index on LinkedIn that you're just not going to reach because they're not there. They're going to be on Facebook in most cases. Um, you got to go where the people are, right? And... Uh, yeah, that's that's my thought on that. Or who you're targeting, right? I mean, like if you're trying to do a campaign or whatnot, uh, you know, we find ourselves doing end user demand generation campaigns. So if it's not targeting resellers or solution integrators. We're going after people that are utilizing that. So yeah, the same as a lot of people in this room would be. Yeah. I think yeah. one example that like, stands out to me would be like nursing, for instance. Which, granted, you can target nursing on on LinkedIn just fine as well. But I think Facebook's, you know, their targeting system could easily pick up nurses better than a lot of other job titles. Because anybody who's a nurse, let's be honest, they probably are talking about nursing in their Facebook profile at some point or another or have it referenced in some way. So it's probably a lot easier to find them. But you're right. You know, there's some jobs that just you're not going to find the VP of supply chain is probably not talking about being a vice president of supply chain on their Facebook <clears throat> profile that often. Yeah, and Facebook, I've said it this way before, when the job title also indicates the industry, a lot of times you can target people on, on Facebook. Like, right, again, right. A, a, uh, what did I say a minute ago? Pharmacy owner. Right. So you know, or, or a fire chief. He doesn't, he's not a chief in the fire industry, like a VP of operations in the warehousing industry would be. So there isn't two layers. Yeah, the job title indicates the industry. A lot of times Facebook can be helpful. And yeah, Facebook is, I know we all you know, have our feelings about Facebook. It's been around forever. It drives us crazy, you know, yada, yada. It's still a very effective marketing channel when you can reach the people there. Uh, from a paid side. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, before we wrap up with our couple of recurring segments, uh, I do want to, as always, thank our sponsors. Uh, Elo Epson, Honeywell, and Zebra are, have been founding sponsors of the podcast since the beginning. We always appreciate their support. Hey, if you like uh, what you've heard here today, if you like the show, you want to leave us some comments. First of all, this episode is going to be on uh, YouTube and in our podcast feed next week, the 14th, I believe. Uh, so, you know, feel free to share with other folks, like and subscribe. Leave us comments, leave us reviews. We'd love to hear from folks. Or, you know, feel free to approach us if you see us out and about this week and tell us what you do and don't like. Tell us some topics you'd like us to cover. We're always uh, want to know Absolutely. what you want to hear about. This, this We do this for you, so we want, we want to know what you want to hear about. Uh, all right. Uh, and, of course, if you want to reach out to us directly, too, you can also find us uh, on Twitter at TechConnectPod. You can email us, techconnect at bluestarinc.com. Right, let's wrap up. We always have two recurring segments at the end of our podcast. First is value to the VAR. It's where we want to take away for our listeners from what we discussed today. So I'm going to ask a very simple, quick question. Is there one or two things that you think that anybody who's listening today, anyone here in our audience here or listening at home later, can do right now to improve their, their social media or their LinkedIn presence? Pay attention to the details. Give it a shot. I mean, we can tell you what's worked for us, but the best thing to do is is – Put some content out there, see what yeah. people react to, analyze it a little bit for, uh, from a timing perspective, meaning when you're posting, what you're posting, formats and stuff like that, and find out what works. Oh, one last thing on LinkedIn, tactical thing. I love the tactical stuff you can go and do. I believe it's a 70 person, I believe there's a limit of 70 connections you can make per day. I have never reached that limit. I don't do what I'm about to say, but if I were in your shoes, where I was a business owner, I would, maybe we still wouldn't hit the 70. When you have the time or even have someone else on your team do this for you, 
Go and make connections with people that look like your customers. And don't be the person that immediately invades their private messages with a pitch. Yeah. Get them in your network. And then if you start executing on this content value adding over time, they're going to find out who you are and what you do. And if, when I realize it's a big if, if they have a need for your products and your services, they're going to know who you are. They're going to know how to reach you. And you don't have to be, you know, again, right in their private messages uh, asking for a sale on day one because... Maybe that works. It's got to work sometimes because everyone's trying, right? right. But, <laughs> but not very often. Uh, yeah, not yeah. very often at all. I say that, you know, have a strategy, right? Yeah. I, I think the companies should recognize the power behind the platform, uh, and they have to recognize the need to have a strategy. Sometimes that brings in other parts of your organization that are not comfortable on the platform because they don't really know what to do. But I think the advice early on about personalizing a a promoting you know a post or something like that, but personalizing it uh, and bringing your own touch to it, that's the that's what you need to communicate to your team in order to make a more effective use out of the platform. Yeah, I agree. I think more than anything, a little self-evaluation never hurts. Uh, look at your profile. When you go to look at your, when you're in the back end where you can do all your stuff to your profile and editing, there should be an option to let you view your profile or you can do this at the company level too to view it as a member of LinkedIn, not just as yourself. And just look at it and say, hey, does this look like something that would catch my eye or my attention if I came along this particular profile? Would I want to connect with this person? Would I want to follow this person? Would I want to follow this company? Is, you know, was their most recent post three years ago? Do they look like they're not even in business anymore? Is their logo different from you know, what's on their website right now? That's the kind of stuff that if you're seeing that, take some time, self-evaluate, figure out what you need to change and update and do for yourself. And that's a pet peeve of yours, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> it really is. Uh, outdated websites just drive me nuts. All right, hey, let's finish off quickly with uh, our favorite segment every week, What's Tech Connecting With You? This is where we get to talk about something from the world of tech, science, innovation that has caught our eyes, got our attention, that's exciting us right now. doesn't have to have anything to do with the rest of the conversation. James, I'll let you start. What's Tech Connecting with you right now? The company is called Rivian. Has anyone in the room heard of Rivian? Rivian. They're an automaker. I became aware of them oh, like yeah. two days ago. So they are a uh, EV manufacturer of trucks and SUVs. Amazon is already, they, don't, they have not produced a car for a consumer yet. They're evaluated at $80 billion, and they're likely to IPO uh, around <laughs> Thanksgiving. Um, I heard on a podcast the other day that like 76% of the vehicles in the U.S. on the road today are trucks and SUVs. And I'm a huge Tesla fanboy. I think their cars are amazing, great company and all those things, but they're going to fill that void. You know, Tesla's answer right now is the Cybertruck. Right. I know opinions are split on that, but this company Rivian is based out of Normal, Illinois. That was Normal, Illinois. I kind of heard my mic go out there. Um, and they're pretty cool. I don't think it's going to be the you know affordable price point for everybody out there. Certainly not for me, but I might be looking into their stock. Very cool company out of the Midwest. Um, look them up. Check them out on YouTube. Really, really How cool. How does a company cool. that's never produced anything have an $80 billion value. Well, they've been working on building a community of raving fans for like three years. And yeah, but I, I mean, how can you be a fan? You don't even answer <laughs> the product yet. They believe in the mission. If you, go to their, <laughs> if you go to their website and read their headline, it doesn't say the word vehicle or car in it. It's oh. wow. the planet and sustainability, and we got to find a better way. And yeah. uh, the kids are here for that. Yeah, the marketing <laughs> message is like there. It. They I got like it, it well honed. All right, Dean, what's Look, second? I've been you? fascinated by mRNA. Right. I right. mean, it, what what a scientific quantum leap that has been uh, for all of us. But uh, and here's the headline: mRNA cancer therapy now in human trials after shrinking mouse tumors. I thought that was really good news, right? I mean, now yeah. we're starting to leverage this fascinating technology uh, that has brought been brought through whatever science and attacking cancer. I mean. I don't know. It's just sometimes you sit back and you think to yourself, we are living in really unique times. I hope this kind of stuff works. Yeah. I hope yeah. that it does what we think it can do. But I've got new faith, you know, with the vaccines that came out and its ability to do these things. If I read a headline like that a year and a half, two years ago, I've been like, oh, it's just another one of those things that they yeah. think maybe is going to conquer cancer. Well, we've, how many times have we talked now about this, the stuff that's come out of COVID that we, you know, hope Right. You know, or, that, or that has been amazing innovations that we didn't necessarily want that to happen in order to get there, but right. we're going to learn some really cool stuff and do some cool new stuff yeah. because of it. This could be another example. That's one of them right there for there me. Go. What's tech connecting with you, man? Well, Dean, I'm glad you asked because I have a little something <laughs> to show you. Oh, oh, we have props today? What's tech connecting with me right now is this. <laughs> 
right. What the heck is this, John? I went to Disney World. That's not fair, by the way. Last week with the fam and got a lightsaber. I built a lightsaber. Oh, hang on. I'm not done. Oh, wait. Can I hold this one for you? Okay, yeah. thank you. I got another oh, one, too. Man. Because I'm just that big of a Star Wars nerd. <laughs> uh, How does that thing feel? Dean? It's kind of heavy, is isn't it? It's got some heft to it. These things have some heft to it. Wow. You think that's what a real lightsaber would have been? You I know? think so, sure. Why All right. not? Really so what models we got here? We got so the... this is this one is actually Darth Vader's. Okay. That is one I built myself at Disney World. So I, I went with my family to Disney World last week before coming here, uh, which was never not the original plan. Vartek was supposed to be two or three weeks ago. Right. But uh, I, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, and they have an opportunity where you can build lightsabers there. And uh, I did the whole ceremony thing. You get to pick your parts. You get to pick what color it's going to be. Put it together. I went. We went back to Hollywood Studios a couple of days later. And my wife says, "You want another one, don't you?" <laughs> well, yeah, but it, these things are a little pricey. And she goes, "Just do it. You don't indulge that often. It's okay." So I found they had pre-made ones at Vader. Got that too. I'll probably mount them on a wall somewhere. My kids are already fascinated by them. So I, they, yeah, know, these aren't toys. Not really. No. Yeah. I mean, you can't like you can't really like hit each other with these. You can kind of lightly <laughs> tap them. But you know, it's it's. It's it's you know it's something to show off. It's, yeah. You know, yeah. Well, it's folks, uh, for those are the, so. it's they're heavy. This yeah, is they are. Yeah, heavy. Yeah. Yeah. They they very much are. So for real, they're legit. All right. So that's what's technically me because I'm a big old Star Wars nerd. So. <laughs> all right. Hey, that does it for us. Uh, I want to first of all thank our audience here for Yay. joining. Thank you so much. We appreciate actually having a live audience today. Uh, we're doing one more of these live podcasts. Actually, we do tomorrow. Out the week after this one comes out. Uh, so, you know, stay tuned for that one as well. Uh, as always, thank you so much. We appreciate you uh, joining us. It is time for us to unplug. Until next time, uh, you know, build your own lightsaber, <laughs> optimize your LinkedIn profile. Maybe I'll maybe I'll change my picture to show me carrying a lightsaber. There that's you go. Not, that's Absolutely. not too weird or anything, we'll right? Personalized? No, you're yeah, good. That's personalization. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until next time, stay connected. Elo offers the widest selection of commercial-grade Android devices for enterprise use cases. Whether you're deploying a POS system, self-serve application, mobile computer, nurse station, price checker, or automation control system, ELO has a reliable and securable edge compute device. With ELO Essential Edge for Android, developers, IT managers, and business leaders can leverage a uniform and constantly growing set of tools over a broad set of applications. Everything from managing connected peripherals like scanners and payment devices to security settings and OS is supported from an enterprise perspective. Users gain the advantage of years of development and customizations ELO has made for many global enterprise customers on its unified hardware platform. Stop worrying about the constant changes and end of life concerns of consumer devices with ELO Essential Edge. To learn more, check out the link in the show notes or contact the Blue Star ELO team. Evelis is the world's leading direct-to-card printer manufacturer. In fact, about 2 million cards are issued by Evelis printers every day in more than 140 countries. Known for their reliability and innovation, Evelis card printers are instrumental in identifying the people and things that matter. Evelis printers can instantly deliver personalized cards in photographic quality and optional data encoding, magnetic stripe, smart card, with or without RFID, to meet your customer's specific requirements. The Primacy printer produces ID badges, payment cards, transit passes, gift cards, and more on demand. To learn more, check out the link in the show notes or contact your Blue Star rep today to identify with Evelis. Worldwide, there are approximately 15 million mobile devices using the Windows operating system in warehouses, with an estimated sales potential of 2 billion US dollars. Shifting warehouses from Zebra legacy devices to modern Zebra Android mobile technology represents a large business opportunity for Zebra and our channel partners. Outdated technology means your warehouse customers won't be able to keep up with changes like the e-commerce boom, same-day delivery expectations, labor shortages, and Microsoft's end of support for enterprise window devices. Let Zebra help you modernize, migrate, and retain your warehouse business with swift, smooth Android devices. Check out the link in the show notes or contact your Blue Star Zebra representative to learn more.